Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today I have a very special episode for you, uh, which is a collaboration we did with Marcin Krukowski. And in this very special episode, we are doing a mock technical interview for a senior Scala developer role, and I will be answering the questions and solving some tasks. The video you're watching now is part one, which is the theoretical part, just questions, and part two of the practical tasks can be watched on Machin's channel. At the end of part two, you will also find a brief summary and feedback session for both parts. Without further ado, I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, please let me know what you think in the comments and also go to Machin's channel to see the rest of it. Let's get to it. Welcome to the first ever Scala backend mock interview. Uh, today we are joined um, by Kuba who will be our interviewee. Pleasure to have Hello. you here. Yeah, so, it's great um, to be here. I'm very excited yeah. for this job. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, the team is great and, and the technology is great as well. Um, so the plan is to um, have a short introduction within um, basic Scala questions, um, or let's call them warm-up questions, and then we'll go into, into coding task that I hope will take us uh, around 20, uh, 20 minutes. Um, but we have as much time as we as we need. Okay, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, perfect. Um, so, um, Kuba, what's um, what's what is the extractor in Scala? How do you explain that? By extractor, I, I think you mean the uh, the apply method, unapply yeah. method. Uh, yeah. So uh, it is a special method used by pattern matching to enable basically extracting values from a, a certain uh, certain value. So for example, when you have a case class, you get an extractor for free. So it's a very, uh, very boring implementation because it always matches the input and it always extracts all the pieces. Uh, but where extractors are like, m they mostly shine is when you define your own when, with your own on apply method, then you can make it sometimes match and sometimes don't match, uh, so that you can check some conditions or Maybe you do some like pre-transformation of the data, uh, or you might want to have an extractor for something that is not a case class and make it look like it's a case class. Uh, but yeah, it's basically just the uh, the unapply method with a specific uh, shape. Yeah, perfect. That's that's what I wanted to hear. Okay, uh, how would you compare um, recursion, normal, regular one, with with the Taylor recursion that we have? Um, in Scala, and how can you uh, enforce Scala compiler to check if there is the Taylor recursive call in the in the method? Okay, so recursion in general is just a function calling itself or calling something else that calls that function. Like basically, just a cycle in the uh, the frames that appear when you call uh, that function, and it just does some work. Uh, that's like conceptually, you have this cycle when you do any kind of recursion. Uh, but in tail recursion, uh, there's this is like a special case of, of recursion in general when the call, the recursive call, so the call to the same function, happens in at the end of some of the branches uh, of of the the function. Well, if if there is recursion, a recursive call, it has to be in in the final expression of the of uh, the body of the function. And then uh, that is important because these cases, when it's at the final call, can be optimized by the compiler. Uh, like you said, uh, it happens automatically when you conform to this. Uh, well, when you when you have these calls in the tail position, the fi the final call. Uh, but you can also enforce that with an annotation on the method, which is called Scala annotation tail rec. Uh, and then when, when you make a mistake, you have a recursive call that is not in the tail position in the final position, uh, then the compiler will, will fail to compile that. It will just give, give you a message saying that this is not a valid tail rec case. Um, there are some cases where you don't technically have a tail, uh, tail position. Uh, like uh, if you're flat mapping and inside that flat map, you also have like a final call leading to the same function, but the compiler cannot tell that it's actually uh, the tail uh, the tail case. And it's still safe to do this, but it's not thanks to any help from the compiler. And uh, I guess we should also talk about why it's important that 
this what's yeah. special about this case so what's special about the tail uh, tail call is that these can be automatically translated into a loop which uh, is great because otherwise if you just have recursion uh, even maybe not maybe unbounded recursion like you keep recursing uh, or even bounded but still deep enough like let's say i don't know 10000 calls deep you risk overflowing your stack uh, because the stack on the JVM or any kind of platform uh, has some sort of limited size. Uh, you can set that, you can increase it on the JVM, but eventually it will, it will, will you will run out of stack space if you keep doing recursion with no guards. Uh, so the tail rake optimization uh, just helps you stay within the limits of that stack. It replaces your recursion with a while loop uh, in, the, in the JVM bytecode. Uh, so that, yeah, you don't have these extra stack frames, which is why I previously said it's con conceptually the same stack frame. Uh, but in reality, when you have a tail recursive function uh, that's optimized, these frames don't appear. Like you, don't, you only have one at the entry point, and then it's just a loop. Yeah, yeah perfect. That, that answers my question uh, for sure. What are traits in Scala? This sounds obvious uh, for sure. But can you tell me about um, mixings as well? Traits and mixings. Uh, so just briefly about the traits and uh, yeah, uh, mixings and, and your opinion on that. Mm -hmm. So traits in Scala in the most basic explanation are like an interface from, from Java. They have several differences, but it's, it's the easiest way to understand it. It's just uh, an interface as in a description of what methods are available on a certain type. Uh, so that you can use this with multiple types, like multiple classes can extend the same uh, or implement the same interface in Java. In Scala, we just say they extend the same trait and then they have some sort of shared interface, uh, lowercase i, not, not uppercase i. Uh, and uh, in Scala, traits can also define like uh, fields, which are basically getters. Uh, I think you may be able to also have like a var in a trait then you would have a mutable field, but which would be implemented by a setter and the getter. Uh, and most importantly, like, I think this is the, the biggest difference uh, from compared to classes is that you can in inherit um, multiple traits. Like you can just extend multiple traits at, in one go. And if you wanted to do this with classes, you would have to, well, you can only extend one class. And then that class would have to extend everything else. So you cannot, uh, you cannot mix in behavior, which is what I assume you meant by the mixins, uh, uh, by mixins. So the way I understand it is that you can extend, uh, you can inherit multiple pieces of behavior by extending multiple traits, which have some, uh, some methods that are either already implemented or abstract, uh, including fields which is a special case of a method uh, i'm sure i missed something but that's, no, that's roughly it that's okay that's that's perfect all right and um, what is a higher kind of type in in scala it's a very special case of a uh, type with with generics uh, so normally you have a type like list of a or option of a uh, that's just a, a generic type and in Scala, like th this is possible in languages like Java, but in Scala, you can also go one level higher. You can have a type that's parameterized by another parameterized type. So you can say I have an F of list or F of option, and this is not possible in, in languages without higher kinded types. So in this case, the F is the higher kinded type, and it is parameterized in something we called a, a type constructor like list, like option. It's not a fully applied type. It's just a, like a function on the type level, you could say. Uh, so higher kind of types are things that, uh, that are parameterized by, by these type constructors or other types of these so-called higher kinds. Yeah. Perfect. Um, speaking of types and, um, and at least do you remember, uh, or can you explain what is the difference between uh, covariance, invariance, and contravariance. So covariance is, I have a video on this on my channel, by the way, uh, covariance is the, the whole concept of covariance and, and variance in general, actually just variance. It's 
how can we transfer the subtyping relationship from the uh, the thing in a container type, let's say, to that container type? So from an applied type to a type constructor applied with that type. For example, uh, when you have a list of some things uh, and you have a list of some things which are bigger than those things, uh, should that also have a subtyping relationship? So let's say a list of string and list of char sequence. Uh, in a language like Java, these would not be uh, subtypes of one another. But in Scala, because list is applied is defined as covariant, uh, when you have a list of string, you can safely upcast that to a list of char sequence uh, because list is covariant. So it says that the subtyping relationship is preserved exactly like from uh, the item in the list to to the list of that item. There's also contravariance, which is the opposite. It inverts the subtyping relationship of uh, the member to the container. Uh, like in the case of uh, probably the easiest example is a, like a function that returns unit. So like A to unit, uh, if you have, let me get this right. If you have char sequence to unit, in Scala, you can widen this automatically to string to unit because you just invert the relationship of string and char sequence. And uh, that's the, the final case, which is the default, the invariant case, uh, which is basically no relationship. This is equivalent to, uh, to the Scala, uh, the Java, uh, the Java world. And what we have in Scala is just declaration side variance. So you can declare this on the type. Uh, so that the subtyping is preserved on the types. And in some languages, you don't have that, but you may still have a uh, call site variance, like in, Scala, in Java uh, and Scala, which is uh, why you can do, um, like you, you use these like generics with the super or extends keyword uh, that gives you like a subset of the variance possibilities from Scala. Yeah, uh, perfect. No more questions about, about that. Um, can you explain um, why not every method in Scala is a, is a function? In Scala, we have basically like two kinds of functions. Like they are not completely different. They just have like different representations or they have um, different styles of working with them. Uh, first, you have the usual methods, which are uh, just like using the def keyword. You define some sort of named method with some parameters, all of which have names. And these are just methods in the bytecode sense. They are like members of the, of the class or interface uh, that you end up having in, in the final bytecode. These are sort of static. Uh, on the other hand, we have functions which are values. They're not just methods and they are values. They can be passed around as values. They can be returned from functions. Uh, you can have a field that is a function. And these are, as far as I understand, uh, represented by values on, on the heap or, or, or the stack. Uh, they're not like in the, uh, in the, let's say, uh, methods section of the class or interface. And, uh, they can be created like dynamically. You can create a list of, of functions. You, I don't think you can do, I don't think you can do that with just methods because they're more static in that sense. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. And you use a different, w the different syntax to define these. So, uh, you can define a function as a, as a val. You just use the function one or function two or so on, uh, type. There's syntactic sugar for that with the arrow, uh, arrow sign. And, uh, you don't even need to give like all the, wait, actually you do. Uh, when you have multiple parameters, you still, they still will have names unless you have like a tuple parameter. Uh, but back to, to the difference, uh, you can pass functions around, you can pass methods. So in order to make it more convenient to work with methods where a function is expected, uh, there's special syntax. Uh, well, in Scala 2, there's special syntax for that. In Scala 3, you no longer have to use that, uh, but you, you basically use the underscore uh, sign to convert a method to a function. Uh, and I believe that is called eta expansion. Um, sometimes it happens automatically, actually, like when 
the Scala compiler can tell that you need a function in a given place and you pass a method, I think it will uh, attempt to convert automatically. I think that's all. Yeah, perfect. Um, okay, another question. Do you remember from the top of your head um, what is the performance of getting a head element uh, from the list in, in Scala? Mm -hmm. Uh, it's constant because uh, lists are represented as basically linked lists. So you always have a, a head and a tail, which is another list. So uh, if you don't need to traverse like some elements of the list or, or the whole list, then uh, you, if you just need the first element, it's, uh, it just, it's just reading a field and, uh, yeah, basically that constant time. Yeah, perfect. Uh, another question. Uh, what is the use of function carrying in, in Scala? Why do we want to do this or is it needed? So function carrying, which I guess we should define first, uh, it's basically when you convert the function from multiple parameters uh, to a function that returns a function that returns a function and so on. So if you say, uh, if you have say a function two, uh, taking a string and int, that would be a function from string to int to something else. Um, so one reason to use carrying is when you have a signature that expects a function of a specific list of uh, a specific number of arguments, like it requires one and you have a function that takes two. Uh, so you may want to like apply that one parameter, sorry, you may want to carry that function and then apply one parameter and then give it to that function. Uh, you could also do the same without carrying, I guess, just by doing uh, partially applied functions. Mm -hmm. um, there are probably other use cases, but I, I don't really see that that often. Um, so frankly, I, I'm not actually sure it's a, such a great feature in some languages actually, uh, actually don't have that. Yeah, sure. Um, another question, um, do you remember the scope, uh, the scope provided uh, for variables in, in Scala? Mm, you mean like a lexical scope? Mm -hmm. So yeah, a variable is visible basically in the block that is, that is defined in, uh, okay. in some cases, uh, you can import that variable or, or value, uh, if it's in like an object or in a value of a class, uh, you can import. Uh, thanks from that. Okay. Um, and do you know how is this Scala compiled? So how this um, Scala code is uh, translated, transformed? Um, how does it happen that it ends up being uh, readable for the for the JVM platform? Mm, you mean in Scala code in general, or can you yeah. rephrase that? Yeah, yeah. Like uh, you know how the when when we have the Scala code, how Scala C, uh, Scala compiler picks this up, uh, what it translates to, and then uh, this thing, how this ends, uh, ends up um, on the JVM. Right, so I don't know many of the details of that. Um, I haven't had to, to fight that, but in most cases it ends up, uh, well, you start with the Scala source code and you end with the, the JVM bytecode. Uh, and in many cases you can sort of convert to something the compiler can convert to something that looks like it was compiled from Java, like in cases that can be represented in Java, you get that. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are several features which don't have like a direct representation in the Java language. So it just ends up compiling to uh, the next closest thing. Uh, no, honestly, there's, there's so many phases. There's like 20 plus phases of the compiler that it would be uh, hard for me to describe everything that happens in there. Okay. That's, that, that, that's fine. Um, let's move on to the effect systems. Um, so why IO, um, as a monad is, um, better than, better than the future or is it better? Maybe I should, uh, put it this way. Sure. Um, so just to show the, the difference first, like why is it different, uh, which would be the base of why it might be better. Uh, so first of all, future is a type that represents a running computation. So whenever you have a future, you have something that is already running. Like if it's, if a future is uh, supposed to produce an A, uh, 
uh, you know that the process of making an A may already have started depending on execution semantics or what platform you're on or how many threads you have. Uh, but you can, you can safely assume that it, well, you cannot safely assume that the process hasn't started. Uh, so it is eager because it represent, represents something that is possibly running. And that is the main difference, really. Um, there's no, like, no, no operator to launch a future. No, no, nothing that would, um, uh, also say, stop this future or something like this, uh, or don't run this future yet. Um, that is the first difference. There are some others like the API of future is, um, strictly coupled to execution context. So execution context being a, like a wrapper over a thread pool, basically, uh, it describes how a task that runs on a future, uh, gets scheduled, like one, what kind of threads and, uh, and so on. Uh, so methods like map and flat map on future, um, uh, will take an implicit execution context parameter, which sort of assumes that you can switch threads and execution context at pretty much every operation. And because of that, the old implementations of future used to be, uh, far less performant because of that possibility to switch all the time. Uh, I think, uh, it wasn't a change to futures really, but more to the default execution contexts, but in 213 and above, I think this got a little better. Um, but the API still looks the same. So you still have all these, all these parameters, uh, of the execution context. Uh, and yeah, you mentioned monads. So future, because of its eagerness and the fact that it starts running immediately, um, uh, it is not a lawful monad in the presser presence of side effects. So when you wrap some sort of side effecting function in a future block, uh, that doesn't actually, uh, sort of like suspend the side effects. Uh, it, it is no longer, uh, well, it wasn't referentially transparent before wrapping and it isn't referentially transparent after wrapping. Uh, it doesn't change that fact at all. So that is how future is different from IO because IO is lazy when you construct an IO value, uh, using IO apply or IO delay. Uh, you are not telling the code to actually run. You're just saying, I will, uh, possibly run this code in the future. Uh, well, in, in the, in the future, lowercase f, uh, I may run it once. I may run it 10 times. I may run it forever, or I might never run it. You're just saying, this is a, you're basically sort of, it's sort of like the, the, mm, the functions, uh, that you have values representing a computation. Uh, and not something more static, like a value, like the output of the computation. And, uh, it's not running like an IO by itself doesn't represent something that runs. It just describes the, uh, the steps to start such a computation and the details of like what thread pools it should run on, uh, or is this action blocking, uh, does it, does the result have to go somewhere else to another IO and so on. So it's just like a blueprint of, uh, an effect, possibly a side effect, um, uh, that you can then give to a runtime and launch. And it also, because it, it, it has a lazy property and not only lazy, but it doesn't actually, that's a, another huge difference. Uh, when you have a future and you flat map on it twice, it only runs once. And if you have an IO and you flat map on it twice, you run it twice. So. Uh, it doesn't remember the result of the previous computation and it has like this isolated model of execution in that sense. Yeah, uh, that makes sense. But you've also mentioned, uh, buzzword, uh, like, uh, referential transparency. Can you, can you tell me, uh, what's, what's that? And, uh, how can we, uh, like, do we, do we, do we have this in, in the functional programming in, mm -hmm. in Scala? Right. So referential transparency basically means that you can replace an expression in the code by the value of that expression or the value that expression produces. So in the case of IO and side effects, uh, well, in the case of just side effects, when you have 
Uh, maybe it would be easier to show with an example with some code. Uh, but long story short, you can inline functions whenever you want without changing the behavior uh, of, of the code. And you can extract functions from, um, so you can extract like constants from blocks of code without uh, affecting the behavior as well. And uh, the simplest example is of, of breaking refresh on transparency is when you have some, some sort of side effect, like, uh, like sending an HTTP request and you want to do that twice. You do this with, let's say future. So you have like make one call, flat map, make another call. Uh, if these are functions, then you will still do two calls, uh, but one after the other. And if you have that, if you extract values from these function calls and you then flat map on them, you might actually run them in parallel, uh, assuming that like, you have enough threads or it's not backed by threads. Um, so yeah, refresh on transparency just allows you to make these changes because you, this, uh, this meaning doesn't change in the case of IO, they would still run sequentially. So okay. that's, that's a benefit. Okay. Sure. Uh, how would you explain a uh, concept uh, of type class? A type class is, well, type classes are one way to do polymorphism. Um, uh, it's basically an extension of, of generic parameters. Uh, so it's a way to add behavior to a type without extending that type, like without uh, changing the actual interface of the type. So you can add uh, functions to a set of types. Uh, like I want to have the ability to add an arbitrary A and I want this for integers, for strings, for list of strings and so on. So I would need some sort of shared interface and I can do this sort of ad hoc. That's why it's called ad hoc polymorphism sometimes, uh, by creating a type class for things that can be added to each other. And then uh, I say like addable of A, or we call it uh, monoid of A. Um, and then I can implement this interface for, for these types and then put it somewhere where my compiler can see it. In the case of Scala, that would have to be in the implicit scope somewhere. Um, and then that enables this behavior for these types that I've implemented it for. Uh, it has, well, type classes have one extra benefit over just like extending interfaces uh, in the types that we want this behavior in. Uh, it's something that we, we don't think about very often, but you can add behavior to a type without having values of that type. So you can, for example, uh, have like a describe type class which says maybe like, what, what's the name of the type? And if you did this with uh, just interfaces that you implement on the type itself, you cannot describe a type without having a value of that type. You, you, you don't have something generic to call a method on. You cannot do this for like int and string without having a valid in, in the string. But with type classes, you can add this kind of information to the type um, and sort of summon it out of thin air uh, with no values of, of these types. Um, okay. And you can use the same kind of idea to generate values of these types, uh, which is, I don't think that would work uh, very well without something like type classes. Uh, but you can, of course, like emulate this kind of thing with being more explicit in other languages. Uh, because in Scala, we usually encode type classes using uh, implicits. Yeah, um, sure. Um, You've mentioned a thing called monoid, and there is not a, a proper Scala interview uh, without a question from uh, category theory. So could you explain the difference between a monad and an applicative functor? Uh, if there is any. Mm -hmm. Sure. So an applicative functor is a concept that describes uh, well, okay, I, I'm not going to like, use the category theory uh, explanation because I don't have that background. I'm just going to talk about types in, like, let's say, Scala. Yeah. So in, in Scala, an applicative functor is a type constructor that has the ability to combine two values to, of, of that type constructor uh, and work with their contents together in without the wrapping, sort of. So if you have an 
a list of A and a list of B, you can get a list of A and B. Or maybe a better example would be option because it's more um, easier to think about in terms of applicative composition. So you have option of A and option of B. You can get an option of A and B. Uh, and you can also transform that into like using a function from A and B to C. You can get an option of C. So you can sort of enter the context of option on both of these values, do something with, with them, and produce an output. And then the result is another option. Uh, now, monads are just like a one level higher in terms of power, uh, because in a monad, that computation that was using the A and B can produce an F of C, so like an option of C. Uh, and then the whole result is again an option of C. So uh, you can deal with these two, uh, two values in the context of option or F, an arbitrary effect. Uh, or type constructor, and then produce another value with that context, and then flatten everything to to one uh, one single option. And so that's like the first difference that monads are just more powerful. Uh, but because they are more powerful, that means there's less of them. So not every type that is an applicative can be a monad. And uh, yeah, that's just that's just what it is. Um, and when we talk about applicative composition, like these two independent effects, let's say uh, two options that end up being combined into one, uh, that is sort of independent. Like you have two values uh, that are created by someone, not necessarily you, and you get the power to combine them uh, and get one of these things. But with monads, with monadic composition, you can run one of these options or like these okay. things in the effect. And depending on what was inside, you can produce another, if you can produce another effectful thing based on this, you can then flatten that into, into a final like option of C. Uh, so you don't necessarily need to have the, the two effects up front. You just need one and a way to get the other based on the previous value. So you have this sort of sequential composition model rather than just like parallel or an independent composition model. So that's the true power. Like just flattening is how you see it, but conceptually the most important thing actually is the fact, the fact that you have this, this sequential, um, actually imperative kind of uh, style of composing, composing two effects. Sure, so that's perfect. the difference. Okay, um, another tricky question for you. Um, how would you explain Tagless final pattern to a five-year-old. <laughs> I would just say that it's a bunch of uh, stuff that you won't need for 20, 20 more years. Okay. Uh, but if I were to introduce this to someone who's not very familiar with, with Scala or with functional programming, um, I would... Imagine, mm -hmm. imagine like a junior, uh, junior programmer is coming to your, to your team. Um, they don't have much of the Scala experience. They don't, they don't have much of the Java experience. They don't have uh, much of the uh, backend experience at all. Mm -hmm. But they see um, Douglas Final in your in your code base, or rather in your in in your wiki, because they cannot name this uh, mm -hmm. themselves. Um, how would you um, how would you explain it to them so they can you know become the first task and and be like productive with uh, with a thing, uh, you know, and I'm not saying, hey, watch this, uh, watch this uh, 16 hours uh, long course from either Dev Inside You or, or from Rock, Rock JVM, but, you know, how would you, how would you pair with them and how would you um, make them feel comfortable with all these Fs around them? So, Tigress Final is a way to achieve several things, but most, most of all, uh, it's, a way to decompose your application into smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one of the ways. It's not necessarily the only way because there's several. Uh, for those who have some experience, you will know that interfaces uh, sort of already solve that problem. Like you can already split your project into multiple components and then combine them um, using several other techniques. Uh, but the way that Tagless Final is different 
is that you can you can sort of make it possible to change how exactly your your application is going to work depending okay. on the so-called effect that we pick uh, so if you write your application in tagless final style completely uh, then at some point when you combine all these pieces you choose which effect you're going to use to to execute that program and you may choose something that that you would normally use if you didn't use the te this technique like you could you could use the same effect anyway just by writing it everywhere but if you use this technique you can have a single place when you when you can uh, swap this out for something else maybe for the purpose of having more predictable behavior in testing uh, or maybe you just want something that has like extra debugging cap capabilities uh, there are several things you could do but i think don't think many people are doing that uh, i think it's mostly people use it uh, as a te technique to decompose uh, things uh, okay that's sure sure that's 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 awesome um your what is your favorite um scala 3 feature that you're um uh, looking forward to use or either using with uh, with a smile on your face one of the features is definitely not having to name every implicit or every given because mm -hmm. you can you can do what implicits are supposed to do you can you can just distinguish them by type and mm -hmm. not come up with with names uh, just because they used to be normal values so now because you can just say given and pass the type and then implement you save that one name every time and uh, you can just rely on the compiler to generate something. It has its own flaws because sometimes you will actually have conflicting names because of this. Mm -hmm. and that's very annoying. Uh, but that's like a rare exception, at least in my current experience, that has been rare. Uh, and you can still sort of avoid that by giving something a name. Okay, sure. And uh, it's not what's like your... my top what? favorite feature, but it's the one that I can think of right now that uh, okay. makes me happy in, in my heart. <laughs> Sure, that's that's what I want to know. And uh, what is your um, least favorite Scala feature uh, that actually is, uh, that actually can be um, can be can be useful uh, in Scala two or Scala three or in general? In general, can be can be Scala three, can be Scala two, uh, whatever you prefer. Maybe not the least prefer the the one that you like the least, but I am not a fan of Anyval. Uh, this is a special type that you can extend in your single parameter classes or case classes uh, and i'm not a fan of it because it's a half measure so the goal is to save uh, allocations uh, to save uh, time and space on uh, of how much memory you're, you're going to use or how much memory you have to allocate uh, for these simple wrappers over other types uh, but i think it because it doesn't always work it doesn't always avoid allocations it's it's just flawed and uh, you cannot rely on this to to do the right job for you and i'm very glad that this is being uh, replaced with uh, opaque types in scala 3. Uh, well it's, it's being it's been replaced more than two years ago because that's yeah. how long we've had scala 3 uh, as a stable uh, version a stable release uh, but yeah i'm glad i'm glad any valves are going to be gone and uh, when we as an industry standardized on using just Scala 3 and not supporting past versions uh, that should make it easier to avoid these allocations. But also I would argue that many people don't need to save these allocations and they just use uh, any val out of principle and not uh, for a real performance gain. Yeah, sure. That's that's quite a common pattern where when some people overuse or underuse um, given features, not knowing what's, uh, what's, hidden, what's hidden behind them. Um, all right, you've answered all my question uh, questions. So uh, let's move on to the coding part. Uh, 